Hello and welcome to a new lecture of Math S401 Dynamic uh, Optimization. Today's lecture we're going to finish the basics that we mathematical basics that we need in order uh, to analyze our dynamic optimization problem. And we're going to do this by going over some uh, results in optimization. Most of these results have also been seen in the course Math S400, in particular the theorem of the maximum and Burgess maximization theorem. So I will go over these theorems again very quickly. So if you would like uh, to go into more details on these results, uh, please look at those uh, videos. So for maximization theorem, basically what we would like to do is maximize something and the something is most of time a function. Let's say that this is a function uh, has an argument x and here we take x to be in some big set x and let this be a subset of r uh, let's say r to the power k right so k is the dimension of the of the vectors in uh, x and then f of course is a function on this set to the real numbers okay so we're looking at the x that gives us the highest number of the highest evaluation of f <clears throat> and then in principle we can restrict x to lie in some subset uh, let's say g okay and here g is a subset of of x right it's a set of vectors from which we can pick x and what is the aim the aim is to pick the x that gives us the highest value of f of x okay so this problem is not always well defined, right? You can make sets uh, G and you can make functions F such that this maximum will never be attained. Okay, for example, if I have a function from 0, 1 that goes to infinity, well, then there will be no uh, maximum here. So there are some conditions under which a maximum always exists, and one of the easiest conditions to use, right, is the condition that F. Is continuous and that uh, G is compact okay and compactness uh, here G is a subset of RK so compactness means that G has to be bounded and G is also uh, closed right so close means that if I have a sequence of elements in G Okay, so this is closed. If I have, so for every sequence of elements in G, if the sequence converges to some element X, then this limiting element also needs to be in G. Okay, that's the definition of being a closed set. And then the definition of bounded set is that, well, I should be able to find an element M, such that for all elements X and G, the norm of x, and here I can use uh, any norm that I want on the vectors, but most of the time it's the Euclidean norm, right? So this is the square root of the sum over all the elements xi squared, okay? So when I talk about norms of vectors in some Euclidean space rk, I will normally use this, this uh, norm. So the norm is less or equal to m. Okay, so this is bounded, this is closed, if it's closed and bounded then it's compact. If f is continuous and g is compact then this can always uh, be solved and there's always an x that reaches this maximum. Okay, so this is the theorem of the uh, maximum. So in some cases we want to generalize this, uh, this theorem. And one generalization is Burgess maximization theorem. So see lecture notes of uh, or lecture video of Matt S400, these lecture series, if you want to know more details about this, uh, this theorem. Here I will also only give the outline. So what's the idea? The idea is that now we're looking at a more elaborate problem. So we have a set X, that's a subset of RK, and then we have another set let's call this the set A 
and let this be a subset, let's say, of Rm. Okay. And we would like to maximize a function f x a. So f is now a function that takes an element in x, it takes an element in a, and gives you a real number. And I'm going to maximize it by choosing the a. Okay, so here the x is fixed, right? And I'm going to pick a. And then I'm going to uh, require a condition. For example, a is in g of x. Okay, and g of x here is a correspondence. It's a correspondence that goes from x to a. Okay, so for any value of x, it gives you g of x as a subset of a. Okay, so it's a generalization of a function, it corresponds, it maps elements to subsets of uh, a. So what's the idea here? The idea here is that x is the parameter of the problem, or it, you can call it the state, okay, the state of the system, and a is the decision uh, variable. Okay, so you want to maximize fx of a in state x, you want to pick the a that gives you the best value of f, okay, f goes to r, so these are just, this is just a number, you want to pick the best number, and then g of x depends on the state uh, potentially and gives you everything that you can pick, right, gives you the range of possible a's that you can pick from, so a has to be in g of x. Among all these choices, you pick the one that maximizes f. Okay, so if you are able to do this, then of course the A will be endogenous, right? It will be picked by maximizing this problem. So what comes out of it will only depend on X anymore, right? So it will give you a number, right? The highest value of F, but this value may change if X changes, right? So this gives you V of X. And this is called the optimal value function or simply the value function okay so this problem is not always well defined there are some uh, conditions that are imposed by Burgess maximization problems such that this is well defined and the conditions are the following so the first let me go here first so the first condition is that f is continuous Okay, so this function here is a continuous function from x times a to r. The second condition is that g is continuous in the sense that it's upper hemicontinuous and lower hemicontinuous. Okay, let me briefly recall uh, the conditions of upper and lower hemicontinuity. Well, basically, upper hemicontinuity says that if I have a sequence x n in x, and if I have a sequence, let me call this a n in a, and such that for every n, a n is in g of x n. Okay, so I have a sequence of x's here, I have a sequence of a's, and for every n, a n is in the g of e x n. Well then, first of all, I have that a n is bounded, right? And the second condition is that if A n converges to A, then A is in G of the limiting X, uh, right? I forgot to say here that X n should converge to X. Okay, so I take any sequence in X that converges to some element. I take a corresponding sequence of A such that for every n, A n is in G of X n. Then these a n's are bounded, and if it converges, then the limiting a is in g of the limiting x. Okay, so that's upper hemi continuous, and then lower hemi continuous is somehow the reverse of this. So what do you have? Again, you have a sequence x n and x. The sequence converges to some limiting x. Uh, and then instead of a sequence of a's, now I have a limiting a. I have an a in g of x. And the lower hemicontinuity tells you that I can make a sequence that uh, satisfies this. Okay, So there exists an n 
there exists the sequence a n starting from n onwards such that for all n greater or equal to n a n is in g of x n and this a n sequence converges to this limiting group. Okay, that's lower Hume continuity. And these have corresponding properties in terms of how a graph looks like. Uh, so for more details of lower and upper hemicontinuity, there's also a lecture video of the Math S400 course on these two uh, concepts. Okay, so let's go back to the Burgess maximization problem, right? So we chose to maximize a function fx a by choosing a, and a is in g of x, okay? So you require that f is continuous. And we required that G is upper hemicontinuous and lower hemicontinuous. Okay. Then we can show that this problem is well defined and it basically uses the fact that upper hemicontinuous correspondence satisfies this kind of compactness uh, condition. Okay. So the optimal value function is well defined and in particular Vx is continuous all right so this what you get out of this will be a continuous function of x okay and there's a second object that's of interest and that's all the values of a that solve this problem okay and we call this the optimal uh, solution correspondence okay so for a given x it's all the elements a and g of x such that fx a is equal to v of x and here v of x is the optimal value, so these are all the a's that reach the optimal value. So basically it's all the solutions of this maximization problem. I can put this in the correspondence. And if these two conditions are satisfied, then this uh, correspondence is upper hemicontinuous. Okay. So this is Burgess maximization, pro uh, Burgess maximization theorem. There are some other uh, conditions that you can additionally impose on the structure, right? So the first additional condition is that f is strictly quasi concave in A, right? So in the second er element, f is strictly quasi concave and g is convex. Valued. So convex value in this of correspondence means that for all x in g of x, uh, sorry, for all x in x, g of x is is a convex set. Okay. So if you want to have more information on what uh, strictly quasi concavity is and what convex valuedness is, please look at again the math is 400 lecture on convexity okay there everything is explained in more detail well if you have these two conditions uh, then what you have is that gamma of x right the optimal solution correspondence is single valued in other words if i solve this maximization problem and these two these conditions are satisfied and these two conditions are satisfied then there's only one A in this solution correspondence, right? So if I maximize this, there will be only one value of A that gives me the maximum, okay? So I can write this element as some gamma, and this will depend on X, right? So it's a unique element in the set. And this here, for different Xs, I can get different elements. So this is a function of X. Uh, this function, because your gamma is upper hemicontinuous, this function will be continuous. Okay. So under strictly quasi-convexity and convex valuedness, I have a unique solution, and this unique solution is a function of x, and it will be a continuous function of x. Right, so if x changes by a very small amount, the optimal solution, the unique optimal solution will also change by a very small amount. Okay, so 
So that's basically why you would like to, the, to have these additional uh, properties because there's a unique solution to the optimization problem and it will vary continuously with the state uh, X. So if you're not familiar with everything I have said uh, so far, uh, please look at the Matters 400 uh, lecture videos and in particular the ones on the theorem of, of the maximum then there's the one on Burgess maximization theorem okay and then there's the one on convexity okay and maybe also the one on upper heme continuity and lower heme continuity if you want to have more uh, information on what upper and lower heme continuity is okay so so far i have given a brief summary of these uh, four lectures so what i'm going to do now now i'm going to uh, prove a result that we're going to use later on in the course uh, so we're going to state and prove a theorem so it's the following we consider a uh, maximization problem as we have seen before fx a subject to a is in g of x but now we're going to see a sequence of maximization problems so in particular we're going to index the objective function by a number n okay and we're going to assume that for all n these functions so they go from x times a to r are continuous and strictly quasi concave and we're going to assume that the correspondence G is upper heme continuous lower heme continuous and convex valued so in this way we know for sure that uh, the solution to this maximization problem will be unique. So we have the policy function that we can write as gamma n of x. So we're going to have a, a set of objective functions. So function f1, a function f2, and so on, function fn, and so on. And we're going to let this sequence converge in some sense that I will make clear later on to some function f. So this limiting function will have the same kind of structure so we can maximize a of fx a subject to a is in g of x so this is the same g okay and here also f goes from x times a to r it's continuous and strictly quasi concave okay so it satisfies the same property so we have a unique policy function gamma of x. So gamma of x is a solution to the limiting problem, gamma n of x is a solution to the end uh, problem. Okay. So we know that these functions in some sense they will converge to the limiting function. The question is will these policy functions converge to the limiting policy function? Okay so this is a different type of uh, question. If the objective if we have a sequence of objectives and they converge to a limiting objective, well, the best thing that we want to do, right, so the policy function also converges to the limit of uh, the limiting policy function, okay? So is the limit of the maxima equal to the maxima of the limit? That's the question. Okay, so we're going to talk about convergence of these functions. So how can we measure the distance from these functions to the limiting function? Well, we can look at fn xa minus f xa, and we're going to look at convergence in some phi norm. So we're going to divide it by phi of x, and remember phi from the previous lecture, phi is a function from x to r plus plus, so it's not strictly positive and it's continuous. Okay, and we're going to want to take the sub over all x and then we also have an a right and so we're going to take the sub over all x and a given that a is in g of x okay 
So this is a set of values that are possible. This is a, a set of numbers. So the supreme of the set of numbers, this is what we're going to look at. And we're going to assume that this converges the supremum. Okay, this entire thing converges to, to zero. Okay. Uh, when n goes to infinity, right, this n here. So let me call this condition one. Then what we're going to show is in this theorem is that if this condition is satisfied, then for all x and x, so for all states, the distance between the best thing to do at problem n when the state is x and the best thing to do in the limiting problem when the state is x, this distance goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So this is keeping x fixed. This is the Euclidean norm between an element in R so remember, this was an element in, in A, so it's an element in Rm. Okay, this is a vector, also an element in Rm, so this is here the Euclidean uh, distance, right? So this is pointwise, we call this pointwise convergent because at every point x, the function converges uh, to the limiting function. Okay. We're going to establish a second result, which is going to give a stronger set of convergence, but for this we need that... Uh, one is satisfied, so this condition is satisfied, and x is compact. Okay, so x is a subset of R uh, k, so compactness means that it's bounded and closed. Okay, so if these two conditions are satisfied, well, then we can show that phi and the function phi n converges to the function phi in the, the psi norm. Uh, and by this, this norm, is the same as the supremum over all x and x of uh, phi and x minus uh, gamma and x minus gamma x divided by phi x. So again, this is the Euclidean norm divided by phi x. This gives you the phi norm. Okay, so this supremum is converging to zero. Okay, so this is. Uh, we can call this some kind of uniform convergence, right? So because it's uniform in the sense that it's the supremum converges, right? So for all x, it will converge. This is pointwise convergence. So this convergence implies this one, but the reverse is generally not true. Okay, so proving this, and this will uh, take the remaining part of this lecture. So for the proof, we're going to establish uh, some kind of intermediate result. So let me look at fx gamma x. Okay, so this is the best, the optimal value that I can get at the limiting problem when the state is x. Okay, and let me subtract fx gamma n of x. Okay, so I know that gamma n of x is the best thing to do at the end problem, right? So it's in, uh, it's also in g of x, right? So it's a possible thing that I can do, but it's not necessarily the best thing that I can do in the limiting problem. Okay, so this is the value at the limiting problem when I do the best thing that I can do at the limit problem. This is the value of the limiting problem if I do the best thing that I did can do at the end problem, right? So this here might not be optimal, while well, this is optimal. So I know that this is a greater or equal to zero. This one will be bigger than this one. Okay, so let me copy paste minus fx comma n of x and now I'm going to add the same kind of thing but not for the limiting function f but for the function fn so I have fn x the best thing that I can do at problem n minus fn x now I'm choosing comma x okay so here this is the best this is when I do the best thing and use it in the policy function of the uh, best thing at problem n, plug in it in the uh, objective function at problem n. This takes the best thing I can do in the limiting problem and plugs it in, in the value function at problem n. Okay, so here this will be greater or equal to zero again. Okay, so because this is non negative, this will be smaller or equal to uh, this here. Then I'm going to take this term and this term, take it together, and this term and this term are going to be taken together. So this is equal to fx gamma x minus fn 
x comma x okay then I'm going to take uh, f n x comma n x minus f x comma n x okay I'm going to divide by phi x and then of course multiply by phi x so this is times 1 and here again I'm going to divide by phi x and multiply by phi x okay so this is just some accounting and then if I copy phi x now this is at one particular value of uh, x and here it's important to see that x gamma x is the same here as x gamma x okay so this takes the difference between f and fn at some value of x and some value in g of x okay so this is lower or equal to the supremum over all let me call it now y and x and a and g of y okay so this x satisfies this this gamma x satisfies this so this is less or equal to the supremum of f let me take the absolute value x now y a minus f n y a divided by phi y and then here I have a similar thing supremum y and x in g y of f n y a minus f y a divided by phi of y okay so here this and this I'm going to keep and I'm going to take the phi x and I'm going to put it on the other side right so I divide this by phi x so I here I have fx comma x minus fx comma nx divided by phi of x okay so what's remaining now I know that this is greater or equal to zero and slower or equal to this here plus this here right so this will be in an upper bound on uh, this distance and the upper bound is independent of x right so this doesn't depend on x and this doesn't depend on x so i know that the supremum over all x and x will also be less or equal to this upper bound okay and moreover uh, because this this corresponds to this term and this term is by assumption going to zero I know that the supremum here which is bounded above by this uh, number here and the number goes to zero so the supremum will also converge to zero all right so this is a result that we're going to use uh, later on in the proof okay so let's now look again at what we want to show we want to show that for all x gamma n of x converges to gamma of x Okay, so this is going to be part of one for all x gamma n of x minus gamma of x, the distance between u two converges to zero. So the proof, in order to prove this, I'm going to use the proof by contradiction. So assume that gamma n of x minus gamma of x does not converge to zero. So if the sequence does not converge uh, to a particular value, then I know there's an epsilon bigger than zero. So this is a result also from Mathis 400. If you look at the lectures on convergence uh, and continuity, you will see this. So there exists an epsilon bigger than zero and there exists a subsequence of the sequence here. So a gamma phi n. such that for all n, the distance between gamma phi n of x minus uh, gamma of x is greater or equal to epsilon. Okay. So if it doesn't converge, then I can find the C sub -C in a value epsilon strictly bigger than zero and a subsequence of the sequence such that every element in the subsequence is epsilon far away from the limiting value or the non-limiting value, right? So the idea is here, if this is the limiting value, then I have a sequence, okay, the sequence does not converge 
to this value. So I I can draw a ball of radius epsilon. I can find an epsilon, right? And a ball of radius epsilon such that infinitely many terms of the sequence are outside uh, this ball of radius epsilon, right? And basically what I'm doing here is I'm gathering all these infinitely many terms into a subsequence. Okay, so every term of the subsequence is epsilon far away uh, from gamma of x. Okay. And now I'm going to construct a set. Let me call it B epsilon. So what's B epsilon is going to be a set of actions and every action is going to be in g of x okay so it's a subset of g of x and all of these will satisfy that a minus gamma of x uh, is greater or equal to epsilon okay so these are all actions that are epsilon far away from gamma uh, x so this set satisfies some properties so the first property is because this here is satisfied i know that gamma phi n of x is in b of epsilon for all n okay all these are actions right it's the best response at some uh, limiting problem uh, i don't care but they satisfy this property because of this so i know they're in b epsilon so the second thing is that gamma of x is not in b of epsilon so why do i know this well if it uh, would be in the set and I have gamma x minus gamma of x which is zero and zero is not greater or equal to epsilon right so this is also true and then the third thing that I know is that beta b epsilon is compact okay so how can you see this well in order to show compactness I need to show that it's closed and bounded Right, so for example, to show that it's closed, what do I do? I take a sequence a n in the set converging to some element a. So all these elements are in b epsilon. So if they're in b epsilon, they're satisfied two things, right? A n is in g of x for all n. And then because g is upper heme continuous, I can take the limit so a is also in g of x. All right, so at least the limiting value satisfies this first property. Second, I know that. For all elements a n minus gamma of x is greater or equal to epsilon so this is a continuous function right so i can take the limit so a minus gamma of x inequalities are preserved weak inequalities are preserved in limits so this is greater or equal to epsilon so it also satisfies the second property so i know that this is also in b epsilon so this is how to show that it's closed and then for bounded, well, I know that B epsilon is a subset of G of X. Okay, because of the first property, this is upper heme continuous. So keeping X fixed, this will be bounded. So subset of a bounded set is also bounded. So B epsilon is both closed and bounded, so it's compact. Okay, so these are three properties that we will use later on. Uh, in particular, Let's start with compactness. So how are we going to use compactness? Well, we're going to look at the minimization problem. So look at the following minimization problem. I have A and B epsilon. And I'm going to look at the dif difference between F x gamma x minus F x a. Here I've taken the absolute value, but Actually, this is always non negative, right? But uh, no loss in generality of taking the absolute value, then of course. So this is greater or equal to zero. So this is a continuous function because f is continuous, right? And I'm minimizing with respect to a compact set, right? Because th this shows that it's compact. So this minimization problem is well defined. So I have a minimum, let's call this minimum uh, delta. So my claim is now that delta is strictly positive. So why is this? Well, let's assume that delta is equal to zero. So if delta is equal to zero, then I know that there is an A and B E, right? Such that this evaluates to zero, right? So in particular, Fx gamma x is equal to F x A. So what's this? This is the maximum value of the objective function at the limiting problem for the state x. And I know that 
by uniqueness of the solution, there's only one value that reaches this value, right? The optimum. However, this a also reaches the optimum. So this means that gamma of x is equal to a. Okay. So this means that if I look, because a is in b epsilon, this means that gamma of x is also in b epsilon. And here we have seen that gamma of x is not in b epsilon. Right? So this gives you the desired contradiction. Okay, so I know that delta is strictly positive. Okay. So why does this help me? Well, now let's use fact number one that gamma uh, gamma uh, phi of n is in b epsilon for all n. So plugging this in here into the objective function, I have that fx gamma of x minus f x gamma psi n of x right make sure that all the brackets are correct this is greater or equal to delta right because they are in p epsilon and the minimum is equal to delta so this has to be greater or equal to delta and another delta is strictly positive okay and um, so what I'm going to use now is this result, right? So in order to get to this, I can divide by psi x. I can do the same thing here, right? So here I know that the supremum of this expression here, the supremum is going to zero, right? So every term also has to go for x fixed. This has to go to zero, all right? Taking the limit of n going to infinity of this doesn't change anything. And because phi of x is strictly positive, this remains strictly positive. So I have that 0 is greater or equal to something which is strictly greater than 0. So this gives me my desired contradiction. All right. So as a conclusion, where did we start the proof by contradiction? Well, we assumed here that gamma n of x did not converge to gamma of x, so this has to be wrong. So indeed, uh, we have shown that we have pointwise convergence. Okay. Then the second part, uniform convergence, okay, this part here, uh, is going to be similar but a little bit different. So what we want to show now is that gamma n of x minus gamma in the fine norm converges to zero. So again, assume that this is not true, right? It doesn't converge. And remember, this was defined as the sub of x and x of um, gamma n x minus gamma x Euclidean distance divided by phi of x. Okay, just to recall that this was uh, defined like this. So assume that this is not true. Well, then we can do the same thing. We can find a subsequence that's at least epsilon far away from this gamma. So there exists an epsilon bigger than zero, and there exists a subsequence, gamma psi n, which is that for all n distance between gamma psi n minus gamma in the phi distance is greater or equal to epsilon. And I know that this is equal to this, right? So it's a sub over all x's. So from this, it follows that, well, I can find an epsilon bigger than zero. I can find a gamma psi n sequence in n, such that for all n, I can find an, if the sub is greater than some number, right then there's at least an element that's greater than this minus uh, something very small okay so let me uh, write it down so i can find an x and an x right and i here i use a sub index n because it may depend on n right it can differ such that gamma phi n at x minus gamma x n should be x n so I'm looking at this norm here divided by phi of 
xn is greater or equal to epsilon minus an arbitrarily small number. So let me take this epsilon over to, okay? So if the supremum is greater or equal to epsilon, then there's at least one value in x that's greater or equal to epsilon over two. Okay. Otherwise the supremum would not be epsilon, but uh, lower or equal to epsilon over two. Okay. Let me call this element xn. So it might change with n, right? That's why I use a sub index, but at least we have this. Okay. So I can find an epsilon and a subsequence such that for all n, I can find something in the uh, x such that this inequality here holds. And now I'm going to define again my subset b epsilon, but it's going to be a little bit uh, different. In which way? Well, it's not going to be a subset of gx, but it's going to be an a state and an action together, right? So it's going to be an x times a. And it satisfies two conditions. First of all, a is in g of x, right? So it's feasible. And then the second condition is that phi uh, gamma psi of n. Uh, no. Second condition is that a minus gamma of x divided by phi of x is greater or equal to epsilon over 2. Okay. So it's basically copy pasting this, but then for a general x and a. So again, this set satisfies three properties. Well, first, because this is satisfied, I know that xn gamma psi n xn is in b epsilon. Okay. The second thing that I know is that for all x, x gamma x is not in b epsilon. So why is this? Well, x gamma x satisfies this property. So gamma of x is in g of x, so that's okay. But gamma of x minus gamma of x is equal to zero. So this is not greater or equal to epsilon over two, right? So it's not in uh, this set. And then the third condition, similar to before, beta epsilon is compact. And for this compactness, this is why we need that this here, this x here is a compact set, right? So here, this is, Remember, here we required x is compact, so this is where we need this uh, property. So if x is compact, then because a is in g of x, a is bounded, right? So this is okay. So a is going to be bounded. And then a is also going to be closed because if I take a sequence of x ends and a ends, so this a ends will converge to a. This gamma of x ends because gamma is continuous will converge to gamma of x and this psi of x n will converge to psi of x. So the limiting will also be greater or equal to epsilon over 2, right? So it's also closed and it's bounded, okay? But here we need this crucial property that the big set x is compact. And now we're following similar lines as the previous one. So we're going to look at the minimization problem. x a in beta epsilon, and we're going to look at f x gamma x minus f x a uh, if I divide psi x. Okay, so this is always greater or equal to zero. There's no problem there. This is a compact set, so I can minimize with respect to this, I get a number delta. And again, I'm going to claim that delta is strictly positive. If not, then there exists an x a and beta epsilon such that f x gamma x is equal to f x a. And then by uniqueness of the optimal value here, I have that gamma of x is equal to a. And then from this, it follows that x gamma x is in beta epsilon. And you have seen that this is not true. All right, so delta is strictly positive. And then because these are all, all in beta epsilon, this shows me that f xn gamma xn minus f xn gamma psi and xn, all right? Have to be careful. Now with the brackets divided by psi 
phi of xn. This is greater or equal to delta. This is greater or equal to zero. And here, this is evaluated at the particular x. So I know this is less or equal to the supremum over all x and x of fx gamma x minus fx um, gamma psi n x divided by phi of x. Okay. So this is greater or equal to this. This is greater or equal to delta. It's strictly bigger than zero. And then this converges to zero. So if I take the limit, this is along subsequence, but along the subsequence, it will also converge to zero. So this converges to zero. This is a fixed number. This is strictly bigger than zero. So this says that zero is strictly bigger than zero, which gives us a desired contradiction. Okay. So this shows that if x is compact, uh, then gamma converges in the phi norm uh, to the limiting uh, phi. Okay. Thanks for watching.